and uh, there's the confirmation. And one more. There it is. I don't know. There we go. Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to He's the Solution Ministries. My name is Lee Arnold. Glad to have you with us this morning. Uh, if you would please open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 3. And this is the continuation of our study from last Sunday, where we covered the first half of Isaiah chapter 3. And this morning, we're going to cover 16 through 26. And also, we're going to cover chapter 4. Four verses one through six. So open up your Bibles to Isaiah chapter three, and we'll begin reading in verse 16. The Lord says, the women of Zion are haughty, walking around with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, tripping along with mincing steps, with ornaments jingling on their ankles. Verse 17. Therefore, the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women of Zion, and the Lord will make their scalps bald. In that day, the Lord will snatch away their finery, the bangles and headbands and crescent necklaces, the earrings and bracelets and veils, the headdresses and ankle chains and sashes, the perfume bottles and charms, the signer rings and nose rings, I'm sorry, verse 21, the signet rings, and nose rings, the fine robes and the capes and cloaks, the purses and mirrors and the linen garments and tiaras and shawls. Verse 24, instead of fragrance, there will be a stench. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of well-dressed hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding. Your men will fall by the sword, your warriors in battle. The gates of Zion will lament and mourn. Destitute, she will sit on the ground. Now, chapter 4, verse 1. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, We will eat our own food and provide our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our disgrace. In that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land will be the pride and glory of the survivors in Israel. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy, all who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. And the Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion, and he will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Verse 5, then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night over all the glory will be a canopy and it will be a shelter and shade from the heat of the day and refuge and a hiding place from the storm and the rain. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we just come to you this morning as we open up your word, Lord, so grateful for another Sunday, another opportunity, Lord, to come together and just study your word together here uh, with our friends of this ministry. And Lord, just to sit at your feet as you teach us, as you train us, as you equip us for what you have put us on this planet at this particular moment in time to do. So Lord, I pray that you would help each one of us to just be, be here, to be present. Lord, so many distractions, so many thoughts on our minds from the week and the coming week. And Lord, just help us to put all of those things aside and just be here and to be present with you as you speak to us, Lord, as you teach us. Lord, uh, just block all of the things that could take up our time or our thoughts during this this study this morning. Lord, we are here to hear from you, Lord. I pray that you would help me, Lord, to get out of the way. Nobody cares what I think or what I have to say, Lord. We are here to hear from you as you teach us through your word. So, Lord, we're grateful. We thank you. We love you. We just commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, as an introduction to the second half here of chapter 3, uh, there was no commentator that said it better <laughs> than the 
the always uh, entertaining Jay Vernon McGee, uh, who said this, women's dress is the barometer of any civilization. When women's dress is modest, it tells something about the nation as a whole. In these last few verses, 20 articles of women's wear are mentioned by name. Now, there certainly is nothing wrong with a woman dressing in style if the style is not immodest. I feel that all of us should look the best we can with what we have, even though some of us don't have much to work with. God is not condemning the women of Israel for dressing in the style of their day. He is talking about the inner life. They were haughty and brazen. Real adornment is beneath the skin, not from the skin outward. Women's dress is the key to a nation's morals. Women's dress is the key to a nation's morals. Yikes. Now, I say yikes because you don't have to travel very far. You don't have to watch too many television shows or movies to see how people are dressing. Now, I, I think Jay Vernon McGee did a good job here in not stepping over into legalism because I think that this topic can very quickly take a right turn into legalism. Uh, and with legalism now, we start saying God doesn't want you to wear that, and you're not being holy in how you're dressing, and uh, that's not appropriate for a Christian woman to wear that. You know, uh, your dress needs to be below your knees. You need to wear a dress to church. You can't wear pants or slacks. You, you need to make sure that your neck is covered and that you're not wearing makeup. You know, there are so many different religious sects around the world that have different ideas about what is appropriate dress. Now, unfortunately, it's the women here who are getting the instruction, but I really believe it applies to all of us because we're all guilty of this. Now, I grew up in a church as a kid where you wore a suit to church on Sunday. Men wore suits, women wore dresses, and it's still like that to this day. Uh, I don't attend that church anymore. I haven't for over 20 plus years, but uh, I grew up in this, and it was very, you know, if you weren't dressed a certain way, it's kind of like, eh, what's going on? Why are you dressed like that? Uh, I have even, uh, we will often meet my parents for dinner uh, after church on Sunday, and my dad will say, you wore that to church? <laughs> because, you know, what I'm wearing is what I'm going to wear in church. I've got blue jeans on. You can't see them below the shirt, but I'm wearing blue jeans and tennis shoes, and that's what I wear to church. You know, which is odd when you consider that I wear a suit to the office, yet I dress this way to church. Well, why? You know, our relationship with the Lord, and I remember my dad used to always say, would you wear that outfit if you're going to meet the President of the United States? And Okay, yes, the Lord is sovereign, and we need to think of him in that way, but he's also our father, and we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and I honestly do not believe that Jesus is going to kick us out of church if we're not dressed to the nines in our, you know, suit and tie and our expensive dresses and our hats and everything else. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, there's a church here in Spokane, and we always see, if we go to Golden Corral, you guys know I love Golden Corral, they got the best fried chicken anywhere, uh, but sometimes we go to Golden Corral for lunch after church, and there are these women that just, I mean, they have the, their hats are like gigantic, and they look great, and I always love, I always say, I say man, you look beautiful, I love your hat. And they are just dressed to the nines, and they have shown up. And again, there's nothing wrong with this unless it is taking priority over who we are there to honor, who we are there to serve, who we are there to, to spend time with. If our dress is something that we are using to, to suggest 
you know, a, a, a level of success that we've arrived, that, you know, we want everybody to see that we're wearing the expensive suit and tie and that we've got the really expensive shoes on because we want everybody to be impressed by what we're wearing, then we, now we've overstepped the line, okay? Because our dress can't be about anything other than getting dressed for the occasion, not to impress people. That's, that's where the women of Judah here, and this is what this is referring to, this is where they've crossed the line because it's no longer about honoring the Lord in, in our lives and in our actions and in the things that we do, but rather it's about being seen. It's about, it's about revealing our wealth and our success because we want everybody to be impressed by what we are wearing. So verse 16, the Lord says the women of Zion are haughty, walking along with outstretched necks, flirting with their eyes, tripping along with mincing steps with ornaments jingling on the ankles. They would literally well, wear bells around their ankles so that when they would walk, people would hear them coming. So they could turn and look and go, oh, wow, look at her. Now, is there still a moral, moral fiber in the women of a rapidly deteriorating society? The station is not without hope, for it is the women who, through the home, have the most formative influence on the younger generation. Now, the arrogant pride seen in Judah's rulers is, however, just as evident in the women. So as you recall, last Sunday we talked about the arrogant ruler. So go back to verse 1 of chapter 3. It says, See now the Lord, the Lord Almighty, is about to take Jerusalem and Judah, both supply and support, all supplies of food and all supplies of water, the hero and the warrior, the judge and the prophet, the soothsayer and the elder, the captain of 50, the man of rank, the counselor, skilled craftsman, and clever enchanter, I will make boys their officials, mere children will govern them. People will oppress each other, man against man, neighbor against neighbor. The young will rise up against the old, the base against the honorable. A man will seize of his brothers in his father's home and say, you have a cloak, you will be our leader. But in that day, he will cry, I have no remedy. I have no food or clothing in my house. Do not make me the leader of the people. So on the one hand, God is speaking to the men here, that if we don't shape up and do what God has called us to do, then he's going to remove any semblance of a wise leader, and we're going to be ruled by children, childish leaders who are not statesmen. They are merely showmen, and they are there not to do what's in the best interest of the people, but to do what's in the best interest of themselves, to do what's in the best interest of their particular party to do it to the best interest of their donors and whoever donated hundreds of millions of dollars of their to their campaign. And we are living in a time that is described in Isaiah chapter three as it relates to our leadership. Now, I'm not saying all leaders are bad. God has uh, put some very godly people in, in leadership places, uh, but we all have our opinions about you know, the current administration and the Senate and Congress and, you know, our mayors and our local council people. And we all have strong opinions about this. But this is this was the prophecy that this is exactly what we're going to be dealing with. And we are seeing it now. On the other hand, we also see it now in how our women are dressing. Uh, if you've been to a beach lately, it's amazing the thing they call a bathing suit. It doesn't really look like a bathing suit. It doesn't really even look like much of anything. It's kind of like, whoa, where did that come from? I remember as a kid going to church camp and girls weren't allowed to wear bikinis because it just showed and revealed too much skin. You know, now I don't even think you can call it a bikini. It's like dental floss. It's, it's like, what is, what is happening? So the point that Isaiah is making here is the arrogant pride in Judah's rulers is also evident in its women, because those who are depicted here are clearly the wealthy, 
whose rich stores of finery have probably been bought by the plunder taken by their husbands from the poor. So it's a pretty sad state of affairs. Verse 17, therefore the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women. Remember, pride cometh before fall. So this arrogant haughtiness is the pride that has been derived through wealth. Uh, the suggestion is, is that the wealth has come from the husbands of these women stealing from the poor, taking money from people that are starving, people who need help and assistance. You know, and I can't help but think about uh, the, the recent pullout uh, from the Middle East, where we, we as a nation literally left billions and billions of dollars in helicopters and tanks and equipment and literally just left it there. That we're, we're getting out of the country, you know, just leave it. I mean, that is just such incredibly wasteful spending. Right? Taxpayers of the United States of America spent billions and billions of dollars to create and produce these, these, this equipment, these implements of war, and we pull out and just leave them there. I mean, this is not smart policy, and yet we did it. And, and it really just speaks to the wastefulness of a nation where, eh, no big deal, but billion, uh, billions of dollars that could have been used to feed the poor, could have been used to help educate those that aren't able to, to make a life. It could have been used to solve some of the homelessness problems that we're having across the nation, across the world. I mean, just so many things we could have done differently, but we didn't. Why? Well, because we're in the last days. That's what this is speaking about. This is what it's referring to. We are in the last days, and this is what's coming. Now, it doesn't mean that we should be freaked out and worried about it. Oh, my goodness, the end is coming. We know that the end is coming, right? God gave us the beginning, the middle, and the end. We know how this thing shapes up. And if you know Jesus is Lord and Savior, you will not be here on that day. But it's only going to get worse, guys. And, and I don't want that to sound negative because it's like, oh, my goodness, it's going to get worse. No, we got to look at it from the positive. As it gets worse, my hope is that it would wake up Christians to the fact that God is wrapping this thing up. We are very quickly getting to the end. The rapture of the church will occur. We then go into the tribulation period, that seven-year period where we're going to have three and a half years of the most abundant time we've ever seen on, on planet Earth, probably similar to what uh, the prophet is referring to here in the second half of chapter 3. But then we're going to have three and a half years of some of those bloody years that we've ever seen. So for us as Christians who will not be here during the tribulation period, and I am one who believes in a pre-tribulation rapture. Now, there are some groups who interpret the Bible to suggest that the rapture will occur mid-tribulation. There are other groups that interpret the Bible to suggest that we will be raptured post tribulation at the end of the tribulation you know what to me this is one of those things that i refer to as a non-essential i don't care if you want to believe in post-trib mid-trib pre-trib all i care about is do you know jesus is lord and savior that's the most important thing have you invited him into your heart and made him your lord and savior do you know him that's that's an essential now once that you need to be in prayer as you read your Bible that the Lord would reveal truth to you. You know, don't just take some pastor or some speaker's word for it. And if you attend a church where they, you know, teach mid-trib or post-trib, you should be in the word studying that for yourself. The Bible says to study to show yourself approved, not show up at some church where somebody else can teach you and train you so that you can be equipped. No. Yes, we go to church, we come to Bible studies like these to be equipped, but never, guys, take anything anyone is saying, myself included, as the, the gospel. Oh, well, so-and-so said it, that must be right. No, we are to be in the Word for ourselves, studying to find out what the Lord 
wants to say to each and every one of us individually. Now, I have stacks of different commentators and commentaries that I read you know, all week long preparing for these Sunday messages because I want to get different opinions, different views of what what others have interpreted, what others have seen, or what others have had revealed to them in their own personal study. But I'm going to take all of that, and I'm going to pray, Lord, show me what it is you would have me to see in this chapter, in these verses. And you all need to be doing the same thing. We are not called to just show up in church without our Bible. And so many churches now, you pull in, you see all the people walking in, not a one of them carrying their Bible. Well, we've got our Bibles on our cell phones now. Well, as in most churches, and I've been to a lot of churches, you don't even open your Bible anymore. They put the verses on the screen. They reference three or four different verses. And, you know, maybe there's some fill in the blanks on the on the announcement as you came in in the bulletin. You, you write out the missing words. And, you know, it's a 25-minute sermonette. And then you, you leave and you go to lunch. Okay, that's not checking the box, you guys, of studying God's Word. We need to study it. We need to be in this book ourselves, personally, individually, spending time with the Lord. So study for yourself. Now, I believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. I do not believe that those who call themselves Christians and call on the name of the Lord as, as Lord and Savior of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, I do not believe we'll be here through the tribulation period. Okay? That's that's. My opinion, you study it for yourself. Now here in verse 17, it says, Therefore the Lord will bring sores on the heads of the women. Now this is judgment for the haughty lifestyle that they have been living. The Lord will make their scalps bald. Now baldness, especially among women, was not customary. And most wore well-quaffed hair, shaving all or part of the head uh, shaving all or part of the head of someone was a sign of disrespect or mourning. A special haircut also seemed to be the mark of a slave. The formerly prim and proper upper class women will be either humiliated or enslaved or both. Now, this is referring to the Babylonian capture of Jerusalem when all of these people are going to be taken into captivity. Verse 18. In that day, the Lord will snatch away their finery. The bangles and the headbands, the crescent and the necklaces, the earrings, the bracelets, and the veils. Now, this is a pretty exhaustive list. There's 20 different items referenced here. But what it really is referring to is the things that draw us away from the Lord. The inventory of the extravagant females' wardrobes matches the list of the hoped-for male leaders as seen in verses 2 and 3, and the Lord is going to take away both, because if we get our, our security from the leadership of this country or this world, then we are not in alignment with God, if we take our comfort in the things that we possess, if we look at our homes as security, if we look at our cars as security, as we look at our jobs and our income as our security, we have left our first love. We need to be looking to God for all of the things that sustain us. The, the jobs that we have, that's from the Lord. The income that we receive, that's from the Lord. The food that we consume, that's from the Lord. The clothes that we wear, they are from the Lord. Everything we have is from the Lord. But when we start looking at, well, it's because of good policy that we are experiencing abundance. It's because of bad policy that we are experiencing inflation. It's because of the leadership that I'm getting taxed more than I've ever been taxed. The minute we, we engage in these types of conversations, we are literally taking control away from the Lord and suggesting that it control belongs in the hands of the leaders. No, that's not how it works. 
Everything we have in us comes from the Lord, and we need to be looking to him as the provider. It's not through our own efforts. It's not through our abilities. It's because God allows us to have a job. He allows us to have a company. He allows us to, to, to generate income or to not generate income. Everything we have is from the Lord. Now, when our eyes get off of that, that's when the Lord is going to get our attention. And that's what he's doing here. He's taking all of these things away, all of the earthly, worldly things that draw our attention from the Lord. He is taking them away. Now, the women of Judah had placed their emphasis on clothing and jewelry rather than on God. They were dressing to be noticed. They were dressing to gain approval. They were dressing to be fashionable. Yet they ignored the real purpose of their lives. Instead of being concerned about the oppression around them, as we saw in verses 14 and 15, they were self-serving. They were self-centered. People who abuse their possessions will end up with nothing. And these verses are not an indictment, again, against clothing and jewelry, but a judgment on those who use them lavishly while remaining blind to the needs of others. Here's the truth. When God blesses you with money or position, don't flaunt it. Use what you have to help others, not impress them. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 4 says, Let your adorning be that of a meek and quiet spirit, for that kind of beauty is never lost. You know, and it just reminds me of, you know, if you think back in the day, the Jimmy Woo's, if you guys remember Jimmy Woo, he was this uh, internet, or what internet? <laughs> this is back in the 80s, before the internet. Uh, he was the, the real estate guru on TV that all of his infomercials had, you know, women in hot tubs and all these luxury exotic cars sitting in the driveway. And, you know, it was all about wealth and look at what I've made and you can be rich like me and you can have all the success like me. And you still see it now as you're just running through your Facebook feed. You see there's this, the, the latest one I saw is this guy driving around in a Ferrari with a wad of cash. And he's literally driving, holding, uh, who knows how much cash, uh, probably fake money for all we know. And he's talking to the camera while driving this Ferrari, which he probably rented. Uh, but it's like, wow, this, this, is, this is proof that you are successful? And anytime you guys see something like that, do not get caught up in it. Do not look at what somebody else has and think, oh my goodness, they must be smarter than me. They must know something. I don't know. I'm going to spend thousands of dollars to learn what they, what they know so that I can drive a Ferrari and I can have wads of cash. You know, again, there's nothing wrong. And, you know, uh, it would be... It, very inappropriate for me to suggest that it's wrong to want to learn something that would allow you to generate more of an income, to have a different type of lifestyle, because that's what we do. You guys, many of you know, we have an education company and we teach people how to invest in real estate. Now, my hope is that we teach you how to invest in real estate in such a way that you can use the increase to be a blessing to other people, that you can learn to invest in properties so that you can provide affordable housing to folks. Uh, I love what Audrey and Ken Turner have done. They, you know, they're buying, uh, they bought a couple of 12 unit apartment buildings so they could house homeless veterans. I think that's such, just such a great mission. It doesn't have to be about driving a Bentley or, or having the biggest house or the nicest cars. It's simply about having the opportunity to be a greater service to others. Now, again, here, I want to be careful because you don't have to make money to be a greater service to other people. You don't have to have money to be a blessing. You can go down and serve with the mission if you are unemployed. You can go down and pray with people if you are, you know, are on your on your final days battling cancer there's so many opportunities beyond just creating wealth to be a blessing to other people so let's not be so short-sighted wealth is not the end-all be-all cure-all to 
to happiness. And, and you guys have all heard the statistics of wealthy people who committed suicide, wealthy people who were unhappy, stressed out. So don't think that money or things is going to change your perspective on life or, or who and what you are. Who and what you are is what God has made you to be. And happiness is found in living a life in accordance with what God has called you to be and what God has called you to do and how God has called you to serve. So the better prayer, in my opinion, would not be, Lord, make me rich, but rather, Lord, make me useful to the things and the skills and the abilities that you have given me. Lord, help me to use those for your glory and for your honor, and for your benefit. Verse 24, instead of fragrance, there will be stench. Instead of a sash, a rope. Instead of well-dressed hair, baldness. Instead of fine clothing, sackcloth. Instead of beauty, branding. Your men will fall by the sword, your warriors in battle. And the gates of Zion, Zion will lament and mourn destitute. She will sit on the ground. Not only would the women be affected by the dark days that lie ahead, but the men of Jerusalem would die. The entire city would fall. And that is why God sent Isaiah with this word of warning. It was a word of warning to, to the people then. It's a word of warning to us now not to get caught up in material things or to think that those things somehow validate who and what we are. So the closing, it relates to chapter three, and then we're going to jump over to chapter four. The closing is this. In contrast with their pride, wealth, and beauty, the women of Zion or Jerusalem would be in deep distress. They would have sores on their heads, and they would be bald. And this baldness may refer to them shaving their heads either in mourning or for medical reasons because of the head sores. Being in deep distress, they would not care how they looked. In fact, the Lord would cause the Babylonian soldiers to take away all of the women's fine jewelry and wardrobes, verses 19 through 23. Instead of fragrance, they would have an awful odor, verse 24. Perhaps from their head stores, verse 17. Taken captive by the Babylonians, the women would be pulled by a rope and would wear sackcloth, black coarse cloth made from goat's hair, symbolizing mourning. Their beauty would be replaced by painful branding by their captors. Just like you brand a cow, these women would be branded by the Babylonians as now being slaves. The women would mourn because their men, that is their husbands, their brothers, and their male friends would be dying in battle, Isaiah chapter 3, verse 25. And the city would be so destitute of men, and the women would be so disgraced that they would compete to gain a husband, as we're going to see in verse 1 of chapter 4. Isaiah this picture of the Jerusalem socialites and their plight might be humorous if it weren't so pathetic and realistic. Now, I think I mentioned this last week, but there is a documentary. It's, it's a movie, uh, but it's about Jim and Tammy Faye. You guys remember Jim and Tammy Faye from the 80s, uh, and they had... Uh, the Praise the Lord Network, PTL, Praise the Lord, yeah. Uh, and they were bringing in millions and millions of dollars. And Tammy Faye, uh, you know, just loved to shop. She wore mink coats. She was literally the woman being described here. And so you see them coming from nothing to, uh, you know, God blessing them through their ministry. And then they basically turn into materialistic beans and spend all of this money on material things and then the end of the movie she is destitute and poor and he's in prison uh, it is a great movie to, to 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 really illustrate 
kind of the 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 life of living for self, a life based on our own abilities and and what and how that ends and it's just sad. You know, for somebody to start out so on fire for the Lord and then to get caught up in all of the materialism of the world and to lose sight that everything we have is from the Lord. Nothing that we have is because of our own efforts or abilities. It's all from what the Lord has given us and blessed us with. And we need to give him the honor, give him the glory, and give him the praise for everything we have, because it can all be taken away so quickly. Years later, Jeremiah wrote that the women during this time resort to eating their own children during the siege. Lamentations 4 verse 10 says, with their own hands, compassionate women have cooked their own children who became their food when my people were destroyed. Leviticus 26 verses 27 through 29 says this, if in spite of this, you still do not listen to me, but continue to be hostile toward me, then in my anger, I will be hostile towards you, and I myself will punish you for your sins seven times over. You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. Now, that is so disturbing to hear. And I only mention it here, you guys, to show how, how dramatically off course we can get. And I think that in many respects, even the Christian churches are getting dramatically off course in, in the fact that they're not teaching the Bible anymore. They're teaching prosperity gospel. You know, they're teaching that if you're not rich, it's because God, God's mad at you for something. Because if, if, if God is blessing you, you are wealthy. If God is blessing you, you are healthy. No. That's that's not biblical. That's not right. Just because somebody is not doing well financially does not mean that, that they're in trouble with God or that God is not blessing them. That's just the season that God has them going through in that moment. God uses those difficulties to teach us and to train us and to equip us and give us the opportunity to be sympathetic for others that are going through those difficult times. So, don't look at your current situation if you're not, if you're not, if right now you're experiencing a financial difficulty, God's not mad at you. If right now you're going through some health things and maybe you're battling cancer, or you know somebody who's battling cancer. I've heard people say, oh, well, you know, you're, you're experiencing these illnesses because God's mad at you and you're being punished. No, that's not biblical. That is not true. God uses those things to train us and prepare us and equip us. And sometimes he brings healing and sometimes he brings death. But it's all from the Lord. So your bank account is not a representation of your relationship with the Lord. And if it's really big, then God loves you. And if it's really low, God's mad. No, that is not correct. You need to be faithful to the Lord with what you have. You need to be tithing to the Lord your first fruits of whatever your income presently is. Success is not a representation of how God feels about you. And illness is not a representation of whether or not God's mad at you. Your walk with the Lord is between you and the Lord and nobody else. So. What is your walk with the Lord? Are you walking with him? Are you praying to him? Are you giving all to him? Are you giving praise to him? Are you faithfully tithing to him? Are you giving of him your first fruits? It's between you and the Lord. You know, there are actually sects and cults out there that check your tax returns to make sure that you are tithing your 10%. And if you aren't tithing your 10%, then they take away various opportunities within the church. Oh, you didn't tithe your 10%. You're not walking faithfully with the Lord. You can't come to this thing. You can't go to that building. 
man, that's so far off of, of what the Bible says. That's why, guys, it's so important that you study your Bible, that you read this book. I'm, I'm always amazed at people who are caught up in these, these cults, these different sects who claim to be Christian. And when you ask them questions, they can't answer them because they don't know. Because they don't pick up their Bible and study it. They just take whatever somebody from the stage or the platform is saying as the gospel. No, you need to study this book. Chapter 4, verse 1. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, we will eat our own food and provide our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take it away. Take away our disgrace. Introduction to chapter 4. This chapter is a continuation of one complete prophecy, which began in chapter 2. We talked about this in chapter 2. Chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5 are one prophecy. Now, in these chapters, we have in chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5, we have the complete synopsis of the entire book of Isaiah, because he touches all the bases here that he will touch in the rest of the book. Chapter 4 being the shortest chapter in the book, as we've just read, it's only six verses long. Now, we have set before us a description of the condition which prevailed at the time of Babylonian captivity, and also of the conditions which will exist during the Great Tribulation period, right before the setting up of the Messianic Kingdom. Now, the structure of this chapter is pretty simple. The first verse is the only one that depicts conditions during the time of the Great Tribulation or the last day. The remainder of the chapter sets before the reader the preparation that will be necessary for entering the kingdom. This section, of course, is entirely anticipatory of post-tribulation or post-tribulation uh, post going into the millennial reign of Christ. The phrase in that day speaks not only historically, but carries with it a prophetic application as well. Now, prophetically, the day of the Lord speaks of the day when the Lord will intervene very obviously in history in the last days, beginning with the rapture of the church. Now, while we are in heaven for those seven years, the world will go through a terrible time of judgment. This is the tribulation period referred to in Jeremiah 30, verse 7, as the time of Jacob's trouble. Jeremiah 30, verse 7 says this, how awful that day will be. No other will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. Now, one of the primary purposes of the tribulation is to cause the nation of Israel to come to her senses and at last recognize that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Tribulation period, that's seven years where the Antichrist is going to raise up and bring absolute total peace and prosperity for three and a half years, will then turn and it's going to be three and a half years of pain and plunder like has never been seen. Now, the hope during this period is that the Jewish nation will finally recognize that Jesus is not some rabbi or some famous teacher, as they refer to him today. Jesus to the Jewish nation is not Messiah. They are still waiting on their promised Messiah. And they will be duped into thinking that the Antichrist who will raise up uh, during the tribulation period, they will believe he is Messiah. And then they will realize he is not Messiah during the final three and a half years. Or at least that is the prayer that they will realize he is not the Messiah. Again, I want to turn to J. Vernon McGee for uh, his take on chapter four. He says, these conditions will prevail because of the frightening casualties of war. Again, referring to the conditions of verse 1. He says, that has been true of all wars, and these conditions will exist in the time of the Great Tribulation. In other words, because the manpower population will be so decimated by war, there will be a surplus of women. So much so that seven women 
will be willing to share one man, and all of them will be willing to hold down a job. In that day, seven women will take hold of one man and say, we will eat our own food and provide our own clothes. So these women, they're not coming to a man and saying, hey, take care of me. They're coming to a man and saying, hey, <laughs> there's one of you, seven of us. You know what? You don't even need to, you don't even need to worry about providing for us. We will go get jobs. We'll take care of ourselves. We just need you to give us a son. That's, that's all they're looking for is a son. Now, understanding the culture of this day, going back to Isaiah, if a woman didn't give her husband a son, it was a disgrace. She was a disgrace because she couldn't produce an heir to the family line or the lineage. Also, remember that women were not looked upon highly during these times. Until Jesus came, women were treated like second-class citizens. They were, they were possessions. They were cattle. Jesus Christ came on the scene and said, no, this is not right. All people are created in God's image. So women were enslaved. Women, their job was to bear sons for their husbands or their masters. But a son to a woman was also her, her lifestyle. So a woman would grow up being taken care of by their father. Then they would get married. They would be taken care of by their husband. And then during their marriage to their husband, they would have sons. And then their sons would take care of them through to their death. So for a woman not to have a son was a very big problem. Now, that same problem wouldn't exist, obviously, in the tribulation age. Because, I mean, you consider that right now, 40% of all children being born are being born to unwed mothers. So women now, I mean, there's a plethora of single moms that go to work every day and they provide for their kids. And, you know, some of you even raised your kids as a single mom. So it's not here about, hey, I need a man to take care of me. It's about, hey, I need a man so that I can bear children. But there's only one man for every seven. So you know what? Don't worry about taking care of me. Just give me a child. That's really what's happening here. J. Ramey goes on to say, I suppose a man will do nothing in the world at this particular time, but keep books for the women and make sure that they turn in their proper share. It is an awful condition that will prevail. After World War II, we experienced, to an extent, a manpower shortage in this country. You guys remember, uh, if you've seen any document, documentaries about World War II, you know, it was the working women that uh, helped win the war because it was the women who went to work in droves and they were the ones assembling the tanks and making the bullets and making the guns and women went to work. We had a similar thing occur during the Vietnam War where we lost hundreds of thousands of, of American soldiers. Now, that time, again, this is J. Bernard McGee's commentary. He said, when I heard that, there was a surplus of 80,000 women to not enough men. <laughs> J. Bernard McGee says, I kidded my wife that she had better take good care of me as there just weren't enough men to go around. <laughs> Due to the death toll of war, spoken of in the last two verses of chapter three, there will be seven women for every man. We'll pay our own way, these women say to the remaining men. Just let us take your name. As I was reading this, and I've mentioned this before, but uh, this just reminded me of it. Uh, this show on TV called Sister Wives, where you have one man married to four women. Now, the purpose of this show is to just bring awareness to the plurality of marriage. Now, this particular family, if you can use that term, they consider themselves to be fundamentalist Mormon, meaning, if you guys understand anything about Mormonism, Joseph Smith's original vision or prophecy, a term I'm using loosely here, was for men to have multiple wives. Now, later, I think it was Brigham Young, 
who said, yeah, that's that's not, that nah, wasn't Brigham Young because he had like 17 wives. Uh, but later on in Mormon culture, Mormon doctrine, uh, they said, okay, no more plurality of wives. That was then, this is now, so we're not going to do that anymore. Well, this particular group, they refer to themselves as fundamentalists, meaning we're going to go back to the way it was, and we're going to have, I'm going to have multiple wives. And when you watch this show, you realize this was never God's intention because it is absolute chaos. And I remember uh, there was at one point during the show that the husband actually says, I don't know why God would ever suggest plural marriage. <laughs> and I said, he didn't. If you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, it says, let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. God never intended for men to be married to more than one wife. And okay, yes, there was uh, application for it in Genesis uh, when Moses originally uh, penned the Pentateuch from God. Uh, but God never wanted plurality in marriage. Uh, so here at these end times, because there's so few men, they're going to resort back to that where, all right, one man for every seven women, here we go, plurality of marriage, and it never ends well. And this, again, just speaks to what a terrible time this is going to be. But this one chapter four kind of completes the thought of chapter three. Uh, and so for the second half or the rest of chapter two, I've referred to this sermon as return on investment or ROI. And I'll show you why here as we wrap up with verses two through six. Verse two says this, in that day, the branch of the Lord will be beautiful and glorious and the fruit of the land will be the pride and the glory of the survivors in Israel. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy. All who are recorded among the living in Jerusalem. And the Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. He will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. And then the Lord will create over all the Mount Zion, over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over the glory will be a canopy, it will be a shelter and a shade from the heat of the day, and a refuge and a hiding place from the storm and the rain. Now, it's important to understand, we just made a big transition, a big leap, okay, from the Babylonian captivity to the tribulation period. And now as we go into verse 2, this is referring to the millennial reign of Christ. So this is the thousand-year reign after the tribulation where, the again, the church has been raptured. It has been in heaven with Jesus for seven years now. On earth, the tribulation is taking place. At the end of the tribulation, Jesus will come down riding a white horse. We see this in the book of Revelation. And all of the saints will be following him. At that time, he will take out Satan. He will tie him up and throw him in the abyss for a thousand years. And Jesus will establish himself as the ruler of the earth, the world, there in Jerusalem. And this will be the millennial reign of Christ, a thousand years. Now, during this millennial reign, there will be people who will survive the tribulation period. So contrary to popular belief, not everyone is going to be killed during the seven-year tribulation. Now, 33% of the Earth's population will be wiped out during the tribulation period, but not all will die. So there will be those who, after the tribulation period, will still be living on Earth. Now, we, the, the resurrected saints, meaning we've passed and, or, or we were alive during the resurrection, we will be coming back to earth in our glorified bodies, but there will still be humans living in their earthly bodies during the millennial reign of Christ, okay? So you got to understand, for context, you need to understand that it's that period of time that these remaining five verses are referring 
2, okay? So here in verse 2, uh, in spite of the coming severe judgment, divine blessing would eventually come. Now, the branch of the Lord refers to the Messiah. And the point is that during the distress predicted by Isaiah, some people will still be protected by God's loving grace. Those protected will be set apart to God when Messiah rules the earth. Now, their distinctive mark will be their holiness, not wealth or prestige. This holiness comes from a sincere desire to obey God and from wholehearted devotion to him. Evil will not always continue as it does now. The time will come when God puts an end to all evil and his faithful followers will share in his glorious reign. Now, those who make it through the tribulation period will be those who have not taken the mark of the beast, those who have acknowledged Jesus as Lord and Savior and lived through all of the chaos and pan pan pandemonium of the tribulation. Those who did not cry out to the Lord will be killed during that tribulation period. So those who remain will be those who accepted Christ. Now, the branch of the Lord, Warren Wearsby said this in his commentary. He said, the prophet looks beyond the day of the Lord to that time when the kingdom will be established on earth. The branch of the Lord is a messianic title for Jesus Christ, who came as a shoot from the seemingly dead stump of David's dynasty. God will cleanse his people, restore the fruitfulness of the land, and dwell with them as he did when he led them through the wilderness. Not just the temple, but every dwelling will be blessed by the presence of the Lord. Unlike in Isaiah's day, in that day, the people will be holy apart. And the land will be beautiful and glorious. Again, this is referring to the thousand-year millennial reign of Christ. Now, if you guys want to study this, you can read more about it in Revelation chapter 7, as well as Revelation chapter 19. I will take you to some of those verses here as we get closer to the end. But again... We have been studying the book of Revelation uh, Sunday mornings at our church, Calvary Chapel, Spokane Valley. So as I was reading through this, it was just such an incredible parallel to what we were studying there in Revelation. And for those of you that have not been going through that study with us, you might be going, whoa, what's going on here? You need to go read Revelation 7, Revelation 19, Revelation 20 to really understand what's happening happening here in, in Isaiah chapter 4, verses 2 through 6, okay? So I'm going to encourage you guys in your on your own time to go read those chapters and study that. It's going to bring a lot more understanding to what we're seeing here in Isaiah chapter 4. Verse 3. Now, you dwellers, oh, sorry, verse 3. Those who are left in Zion, who remain in Jerusalem, will be called holy, and all who are recorded among them living in Jerusalem. There will be those of God's people, both of Israel and of the Gentiles, during the Great Tribulation who will survive that period. Those who are martyred will, of course, be resurrected at the end of that time. In Matthew, the Lord Jesus expressed it in a way that may seem strange, but he is looking at the end of the Tribulation period when he says, and if you guys would, hang it right in your Bible, and you're going to want to make a note here in Isaiah next to verse 3 of chapter 4. You're going to want to reference Matthew chapter 24. So we're going to look at that. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, which says this. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Okay, now, if we look at verse 13, 12 of that, it says, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Those are those who will accept the mark of the beast during the tribulation period. Uh, they will be killed during that time. But those who stand firm, meaning they do not take the mark of the beast, will be saved. Okay. 
Now, they will be sealed at the beginning of the tribulation period. So now let's look to Revelation chapter 20, okay? So go to Revelation chapter 20. Again, hang a right in your Bible. Revelation chapter 20. And we're going to read verses 4 through 16. Verse 4 says, I saw thrones on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They come to life and reign with Christ a thousand years. So even the saints who are killed during the tribulation period will be resurrected to reign and participate during the millennial reign of Christ. Okay, Those who were dead before this time will not be resurrected until the thousand year reign of Christ. But these tribulation saints who are either beheaded or who manage to live through the tribulation period they will uh, reign or they will be alive during this time. Verse five, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who are part in the first resurrection. The second death has no power over them, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. This is in reference to those who survive the tribulation period. They will not be resurrected or in their glorified bodies. They will simply be those tribulation saints who survived the tribulation period. Now, verse 7. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Now, who, who is Satan gathering for battle here at the end of the thousand year reign? Well, remember, there will be those who survive the tribulation period. So they never died, but they accepted Christ. So they are human beings still in their human bodies during this thousand year reign of Christ. They will have children, and those children will have children, and those children's children's children will have children. And during this thousand year reign of Christ, there are going to be those who will begin to reject Christ, even though their parents were saved. Remember, guys, salvation does not come through our parents. Salvation comes through our own personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So it is the kids of these kids of these kids who are no longer walking with the Lord. Even though Jesus is reigning from Jerusalem, there now is this whole new group of people that will begin to reject Christ. That is who's being referred to here during this time. So Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. In number, they're like the sand of the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. This is Jerusalem. But fire came down from heaven and devoured them. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. And they will be tormented by day and night forever and ever. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, earth and sky, fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the death, and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what he had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of the fire, lake of fire, and the lake of fire is the second death. If any man's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, guys, this is some pretty heavy stuff. Okay. Now, I would imagine that there are some of you scratching your head going, what in the world is happening here? <laughs> 
because sadly, guys, a lot of this stuff is just not taught in churches anymore. Why? Because, you know, it's not all the feel good, warm and fuzzies where, you know, I want to go to church and after my 20 minutes, I want to be built up and inspired and encouraged. I want to go out and be on fire for the Lord. Well, that's great, but we still need to know what the Bible says. You guys have got to understand and be familiar with end times and what's going to be transpiring during this time, because I will tell you this, nothing should fire you up more to go out and share Christ with anybody and everybody than to understand what happens during the end times. Nobody should want to be here for this. And unfortunately, for those that don't accept Jesus Christ now, this is what happens. The mark of distinction, here's an interesting note, the mark of distinction for surviving Israel will be holiness, not wealth or prestige. Their sins will be forgiven. How great it would be if this were the mark of distinction in our world today. Can you imagine if people were praised for holiness? If people were put on covers of magazines for being pure and holy and thoughtful, but that's not who graces the covers of magazines. It's the wealthy, the successful, the uber-talented, sports stars, celebrities, all for what they've done, for what they've earned, for what they've created, not for their holiness. But in these days, in these days that Isaiah is prophesying, it is holiness that will be celebrated. Verse 4, and the Lord will wash away the filth of the women of Zion. He will cleanse the bloodstains from Jerusalem by a spirit of judgment and a spirit of fire. Zechariah chapter 13 verse 1 tells us that in that day there will be a fountain opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanliness. God's people must be prepared to enter the kingdom. Now, this brings up a very pertinent question. Now, this is coming out of uh, John Corson's commentary. He said this, he said, each year we stand on the threshold of a new year, and we say that we're going to do better, right? New Year's resolutions, we've talked about that. We say we're going to do better, and we've been saying the same thing for a year. But here's my question. Are you fit for heaven? Suppose God took you to heaven as you are right now. Would you be fit for heaven? Now, I cannot answer this question for you, but God is going to have to do a great deal of repair work on Lee Arnold to make me ready for heaven. And that is what life is about. Is it is, It's a school to prepare us for eternity. Many people make the sad mistake and think that this life is all there is. Preparation is made on earth for eternity. Suppose God took you to heaven as you are right now today. Would you be a square peg in a round hole? I'm afraid I would be. Beloved, it does not yet appear what we shall be, he is going to have to make some changes. And I just, I like the thought of that. Are we emotionally, spiritually prepared to go to heaven? Meaning, are we so in love with Jesus that we can't wait to get there? Or are we so focused on what's going on on this planet that our time and energy and effort is spent worrying about making money and possessions and wealth accumulation and inheritance. And are we heavenly minded or are we earthly minded? Now, again, there's a balance here. Uh, the statement is that person is so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. So we got there's got to be balance, right? God put us on this planet. And we have responsibilities and we have mortgage payments. And we have things that we need to be, that we need to be responsible for and we need to be good stewards of, but we need to make sure that we're not so entrenched in the things of the world that we're not focused on the things of heaven. 
Verse five. Then the Lord will create a spirit of fire. Then the Lord will create over all of Mount Zion and over those who assemble there a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Over all the glory will be a canopy. Now, this is referring to, it's going back to the time where God was protecting the children of Israel as he was leading them out of captivity from Egypt into the promised land. And he led them by a cloud of fire by day, uh, or, or a, uh, what does it say here? Um, uh, a cloud of smoke by day and a glow of flaming fire by night. Now it's referring here to God's protection in the promised kingdom age. This is the millennial reign. Each family among the redeemed in Israel will enjoy the same divine protection as did the Israelites in the wilderness during the forming days of the nation. This is true for both Jews and Gentiles. Everyone, what a glorious day that will be. Guys, I, I as I've been studying the millennial reign and this thousand years where Jesus will be on the throne, oh my goodness, that is going to be so incredible. Right, the resurrection is 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 Jesus bringing his bride, and finally the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then we have our 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 seven year honeymoon period with Jesus up in heaven, and then at the end of that seven years, where on earth just total chaos and carnage is taking place, we come down with him, and then he establishes his kingdom, and now Jesus himself is sitting on the throne in Jerusalem reigning over the earth, where we will be for a thousand years during this period. Oh, I just, this, I can't, I can't wait. This is just going to be so incredible. Verse six, it will be a shelter and a shade from the heat of the day and a refuge and a hiding place from the storm and the rain. After saying the times are going to be dark and difficult and brutal and bloody in verses 2 through 6, Isaiah says there's hope for Israel will experience a tremendous awakening. Thus, the people of Israel, the day of the Lord begins as a dark day indeed. But this is not surprising for the Hebrew reckoning of any day begins with the setting sun. But I like the Hebrew way of thinking better because it begins in darkness and works towards light. The day of the Lord begins in darkness, judgment, wrath, trouble, plague, problems, war, worry, disease, destruction, but then the sun comes. Jesus Christ comes back, and that's why in talking to Israel in Matthew 24, verse 13, Jesus says, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved because people who made it through the tribulation, Jesus is coming back, and he's going to purge the people of Israel of their unbelief, and their, their eyes are going to be opened, and they're going to finally realize Jesus is the Messiah. Security will come to the nation Israel in that day at last. Now today, Israel does not have peace. Therefore, this prophecy is not being fulfilled presently. I have heard people say that we are living in the millennial reign, and I'm thinking, how can you even... How can you read your Bible and think this is the millennial reign of Christ? No, there has to be peace in Israel, in Jerusalem, which there is not. The Jews are not back in the land with every man dwelling under his vine and fig tree in peace. And here's a note. Peace always follows grace, mercy, and cleansing. And the problem has never been with the political party. The real problem has never been with the foreign country. Problem is in the human heart. We war because it is in our hearts. Man is a warlike creature because he is a sinner and refuses to deal with that question. And there will be one war right after another until the heart of man has changed. All right now we're worried about what Putin is going to do. Is he going to go to battle and fight the Ukraine and, and try to inhabitate Ukraine? Right. So now there are all these sanctions against Russia and you know, Putin, you better not mess with Ukraine or there's going to be trouble. It's, we're not living in a time of peace. Peace is coming. Peace always follows grace and mercy and cleansing. Said differently, God's people will always, God's people will be 
forever protected from all distress. Now, here's my application and my closing for my clock watchers. I'm almost done. All this said, why do we spend so much time debating, worrying, and arguing about the political situation of this country? We complain about who's in power, and we complain about decisions that are being made, and we stress over taxes and inflation and the implications of them on our personal finances. We worry about the end of our life. We worry, period. Why? God has given us a play-by-play -play description of everything that will transpire before, during, and after the end times. For those of us that know him, our eternity is established. Our name is written in the book of life. Our place in eternity is with our Lord and Savior. Therefore, why invest in wasted effort towards things that cannot be changed. God is in control and God is in charge. Everything that is currently happening is simply to get our attention, not to have us kicking against the goads, trying to change God's plan or God's agenda, but rather to realize that the end is near. Now, if we were to spend the same amount of time, energy, and effort that we spend on political discussions, Facebook posts, presidential rants and tweets complaining, if we were to invest that same time, effort, and energy on sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, how many people could we influence for the kingdom of God? We need to stop wasting our resources on changing people's political convictions and start focusing on their eternal convictions. Because here's the truth. The end of the age is coming and billions are still headed for hell. Now, as I gotta tell you, I was personally challenged by this. So I want every single one of us to take an inventory of our life and of our time and ask this question, how much of my time is being invested towards the kingdom where my efforts have an eternal effect and how much time am I investing towards earthly pursuits where eternity will not be changed at all? Now, this doesn't mean to chuck it all and become a full-time missionary. It might, if that's what God has for you. But what I think that it does mean is that it's time for all of us to wake up and realize that every day we have left on this planet is to be used for full-time ministry because as Christians, we are all full-time missionaries. Our job, our work, our recreation, everything we do, everywhere we go, there's an opportunity for ministry, which is why I titled this sermon, Return on Investment. What is the ROI on our time, our energy, and our effort as we use it or squander it to share God's kingdom with others? Let's pray together that the Lord would use our lives, that he would use our influence, and that he would use our access to make a positive difference for Christ in the lives of every person we come in contact with. Let's pray. Lord, we just come to you at the close of a lot of information. <laughs> and Lord, admittedly, these verses and this topic is pretty heavy. And Lord, for a lot, it's possibly something they've not heard before or we're not aware of. And Lord, I pray that you would bring clarity to them through their own personal study of these chapters, these verses, Lord, as it relates to uh, what's going to happen in the end. What is the end time prophecy? But Lord, that it might spark a, a enthusiasm to better understand the end times. And Lord, that uh, maybe it would cause people to take up a personal study 
of what the end times consist of and what they look like. But Lord, more than anything, that the things that were unuseful, Lord, will be forgotten. And Lord, the things that you want us to focus in on would be remembered and they would be the top of our mind. And Lord, that we really would take an inventory of of our time and our our efforts and our 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 service to you and lord to really see if if we are living for you if we are working for you if we are using the opportunities that you give us for ministry lord help us to be mindful of the fact that the end is coming You've told us that in your word. And Lord, there's still so many that don't know you. Lord, help that to inspire us, to motivate us, to encourage us, to be bold for you, to step out for you. And Lord, to just be a positive light in whatever situation you've put us in. Everywhere we go, Lord, you've put us there for a purpose, for a reason. Lord, help us to answer the call and to be used for you, and to be excited about being used by you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We praise you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to serve you and to be used in this way. We love you, and in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, um, you guys, uh, I put Jerry and Dorothy on the spot a few weeks ago. I'm going to do it again. Uh, because I know that there's going to be questions from our study here this morning, and this is a great reason to attend Wednesday's discussion. Uh, again, this happens Wednesday morning at 8 a.m. Pacific, 9 Mountain, 10 Central, 11 Eastern. You're all invited, and it's it's open forum, open discussion. It gives you the opportunity to ask questions. So any questions that you might have from the study this morning, uh, that's a great venue to go and uh, ask those questions. And certainly, if you want to ask questions directly to me, shoot me an email. Uh, also, if anyone needs prayer, you can always call us. We'd love to pray with you. The number for that is 800-461-0216. Uh, but I just pray, guys, that uh, this study encourages you to go out and be bold for Jesus and to be on fire for him and to share him with anybody and everyone that you come in contact with. So I want to thank you guys for joining us here today. I uh, pray that you have a fantastic week, and uh, Lord willing, we'll see you here next Sunday as we pick up our study in Isaiah chapter 5. I'm just loving this study. So see you guys next week. God bless you. See you soon.